Hi, and welcome back to Mom and Mind. I'm your host, Dr. Kat. On this episode, I am joined by Dr. Crystal Lau. She is certified European Lifestyle Medicine Health and Fitness Advisor, is a leading postpartum wellness consultant who specializes in bridging cultural practices with modern postpartum care. So some of the things we're going to be talking about today um, are the confinement practices and the rising interest in this cultural postpartum practice as well as adapting it um, and respecting a cultural practice and postpartum care um, that is flexible and adaptable to the needs of um, the person who is using that form of practice. She's also going to give us a little sneak peek into some of the collaboration work she's doing on snoring in postpartum and in pregnancy. And I'm really really interested in this. It's not something we've ever discussed on the podcast. And uh, so she touches on this a little bit with more to come in later years uh, on this work that she's doing. Dr. Lau currently lives in France, but originally she is from Malaysia where she grew up using the best of both worlds, traditional Chinese medicine and allopathic medicine. She followed the Chinese postpartum confinement practice after birthing her two children Currently, Dr. Lau serves as a board member for the nonprofit Military Birth Resource Network and Postpartum Coalition and continues to volunteer with the Army Community Services in USAG Wiesbaden as a military retiree spouse. I'm sure you'll love this conversation with Dr. Lau as much as I did. So let's dive in. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Kat. I'm really excited to finally get to do this with you. Yeah, I am too. And also, thanks for coming to me from a totally different part of the world. I don't even know what time it is for you over there right now. Uh, it's about 930, but I pretty much work around the clock just because uh, with the two girls, my two youngest ones, um, mm -hmm. uh, having to write my book and do everything when they're napping or sleeping. Mm -hmm. I try to I try to get my sleep, but you know, we, we we do the work when we can pretty much. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yes. Well, I've been really looking forward to our conversation. Um, and I know a lot of people are going to want to hear what you have to say too. Um, we're going to be talking about the confinement practices and really, really get into some stuff and also, um, you know, a little bit of your personal experience, um, as well. And I'm really, really also excited to talk about something I've never talked about on here, which is snoring in pregnancy and postpartum. I'm, I'm yes. Like, okay. So absolutely. Um, okay. So let's, let's um, start though with confinement and talk about what that is and also what the please do pronounce um, in Mandarin, <laughs> how you say confinement. Absolutely. So in Mandarin it's called Zuo Yue Zi. And I do have to say that slowly because disclaimer, Mandarin is definitely not my first, second or third language <laughs> so that's why um so i'm malaysian um third generation and growing up there english and bahasa malaysia are our first languages essentially so mm -hmm. when we say confinement to a lot of east asians we automatically know that means postpartum rest because that's a very cultural thing so at malaysia we have three major races you've got um, the malays chinese and indians and pretty much when anyone says like you know oh hey cat are you going to do confinement you understand that that person is pregnant and the question is, are you going to do a postpartum rest practice after you've given birth? But in the West, there's, of course, a completely different connotation when you say confinement. It just means jail time, imprisonment. But ironically, though, my friends and, you know, just the, the people in my part of the world, they're like, oh, you're going to go to mummy jail and stuff. But it's more like a <laughs> ha ha thing. Um, yeah, mainly because confinement in general, you can do that at home or in Asia, it's a booming business. They call them confinement centers. Again, it doesn't sound very great to the West, um, <laughs> but essentially they are mostly hotels or luxury hotels where the mom um, in the past dads weren't allowed, but that's changed now. And pretty okay. much the family unit. Yeah, but pretty much mom, newborn and um, the spouse. Uh, you know, if you've got other kids, they probably will, the spouse will probably, you know, will not stay. But you have the choice of, you know, um, the whole family staying at these hotels for the full 30 days after childbirth. So you pretty much go there right after the hospital. Wow. And then you stay there. And uh, it's expensive because you're catered for the whole time. All your meals are prepared for you according mm -hmm. to. So the confinement practice 
is rooted in Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And you will find variation of this practice all around East Asia. Um, The most popular one in the West, especially in the States now, you will find the postnatal retreats. They are Mm -hmm. popping up everywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, many of the founders are Korean of Korean heritage. Um, It's pretty similar just because I think East Asia's traditional medicine was pretty much, you know, Chinese medicine, because if we think about our history back then, the whole dynasty of, you know, China was pretty much East Asia. So yeah, so a lot of those, so even in Thailand, um, they call it roasting by the fire in Cambodia, Vietnam, and even in Indonesia. a lot of the concepts like keeping warm mm-hmm. and staying and resting, allowing mom and baby to rest is, is pretty much what the confinement means. But for myself, uh, because obviously I'm more familiar with the Chinese side, being that's my heritage, um, that's what I kind of dive deeper into mm-hmm. in my book and in the things that I'm doing now. Mm-hmm. So that is pretty much what confinement is. Um, but what it is not, and I love that you asked that question, because um I was at one point told that when you do your confinement month, you pretty much are impervious to any other ailments that come after (laughs) because Mm -hmm. you eat all the food you're supposed to, you take all the herbs you're supposed to and you rest and technically you should be fine after that. When I say fine, it means that you're unlikely to develop postpartum depression or, you know, um, arthritis or rickety bones in your old age because Mm -hmm. you've done this resting. And I think that's just not quite true. That's not it. Because Mm. um, I like to say jokes on, I guess, my people, so to speak, because I developed really bad postpartum depression. Mm. Uh, I think between the fourth to fifth month Mm. postpartum. And I did after having a confinement. Yes, I did my full 30 days. My mom came over. We were, I had my first child in Alabama. My husband was stationed there at the time. And she came and helped out for the, actually for about three months. So um, that first 30 days, I did everything according to what she told me to do. Um, I did not wash my hair for two weeks. Mm. That was, <laughs> that was horrible. <laughs> Use dry shampoo, but it's not the same. Um, and yeah, I took the quickest showers possible because the idea is that you shouldn't expose yourself to, you know, dampness and cold and all of that stuff during the 30 days. So mm-hmm. the olden days and even some people who practice it very traditionally now, they really don't shower. They don't wash their hair for 30 days, which uh, we'll go into that a bit later. That's that's okay. that's more tradition and taboo rather than actual like Chinese medicine principles. Ah, OK. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, so I. I followed what she did. I ate all the stuff. I managed to procure herbs from a Chinese medicine herbalist in the States. Mm -hmm. I did all the things and now still spiraled, had really bad postpartum depression, went on my antidepressants, which helped a lot to get Mm -hmm. through that fog in the Mm -hmm. beginning. Um, Yeah. So I would say confinement is not that magical experience where if you do it, you are somehow magically protected from a lot of maternal you know health the poor outcomes Mm -hmm. honestly so Mm -hmm. yeah yeah thank you for for speaking to that um I mean I know that uh in some ways when I'm going to just speak broadly broad strokes sometimes when things that uh, come from other countries get sort of um, brought over to the U.S. or somewhere else where they're not like originally mm-hmm. from, they get shifted or changed or sometimes watered down or um, other things get mixed in, whatever, things shift and change. But um, uh, I, I was just curious, you know, because the, it's not a Western practice, mm-hmm. um, what you know, I mean, maybe you can't do the compare and contrast, but like what people are experiencing if they're doing it um, here in the U.S. versus, you know, somewhere where it's more commonly practiced, um, how it might differ. But uh, that, it, the, you could have a lot of answers to, to that question. Yes, absolutely. Because even for myself to do it in Alabama was very different to how my friends had to do it by themselves when they were in Australia. I had some friends, especially during COVID, they had their second child, Mm -hmm. they were going to do the confinement, but, you know, travel restrictions, all of that. And they were like, oh my gosh, how do I do this? It was vastly different. Mm -hmm. Although technically you would assume it's similar because we are diaspora in a Western country Mm -hmm. uh, doing this practice alone. 
but the experience is still so varied and it really depends because this practice is very village-based, community-based. I think if you don't have that, it the experience changes a lot. And it's also different when you have your mother and mother-in-law come do it for you than if you had hired someone to do it for you or if you went to a postnatal retreat to experience that. Very different. And I do remember actually looking up um, when I was doing research for my book, were there any clinical trials or observatory studies done on outcomes? And to be honest, there were no big um, you know, like clinical trials to observe what are the you know, even mental health outcomes mm-hmm. for those who did the practice and didn't, because there's so many nuance to it that you really right. have to try to control as many situations right. as you would. And some things we can't control, like, well, the relationship between the new mom and, you know, the mother or the mother-in-law that's stepping in or the mm-hmm. maternal figure, that's, that's a lot to it. So right. I right. would say overall, these studies, they couldn't really conclusively say, um, especially in the mental health part, did the confinement practice actually lessen, you know, postpartum Mm -hmm. depression or not? It was very mixed. Some yes, some no. Mm -hmm. So that's actually a part I hope down the road when I get the more like the energy and time, I would love to explore this in a research setting because, you know, the idea is um, there are a lot of papers that have come out over the past five years to describe how migrant Asian women want to follow this but whether or not like we say the health outcomes match we don't know so mm-hmm. I think it's worth exploring down the yeah. road um, yeah. Yeah. but yeah I, I would say that um, you know to your question because this confinement practice is a, such a big business in East Asia and it's only growing mm-hmm. I think that appeal is starting to be seen in the West because of the maternal crisis that's going on in the U.S. Right. And naturally, the U.S. is a leader in many things. And as soon as the U.S. talks about a certain topic and really champions it, it starts to spill over to many other. Mm. And I see that in Europe as well, because I'm based oh. in France now and then previously in Germany. Uh, you see people talking about what the U.S. is doing. Like France, just a few months ago, they um, made abortion a constitutional right because they were observing what was happening in the U.S. with mm-hmm. all the bills that are happening. Mm-hmm. They decided uh, we're going to do something about this <laughs> in right. our country. Right. So I feel like with now the attention on maternal health postnatal in the U.S., I have no doubt Europe will eventually kind of follow. Right. And postnatal retreats are you know blooming in the U.S. right now because um, a lot of the founders are of Asian heritage and mm-hmm. they've also traveled back to Asia to oh. have a look at what's going on. Um, and as far as I know, I think one of the biggest um, Asian postnatal retreat businesses, they branched out from China to Singapore back in October because uh, this year is the year of the dragon. And uh, I can tell you from what I've just looked up the census, a lot of Asian countries, there's always a fertility boost around the dragon year because the belief is if you have a dragon child, you brings luck to the family and the mm-hmm. child is lucky. And I, I myself am a dragon baby. So um, mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of pressure, not going <laughs> to lie. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, but yes, my year, every 12 years is the cycle because um, mm-hmm. the 12 zodiac signs for most uh, Asian, the zodiac. So there's a baby boost. So the businesses know and then so the idea, yeah, and the idea is that, well, you are the mother of my dragon grandchild or my dragon mm-hmm. child. Mm-hmm. I got to treat you extra special. And all these things are so cultural. It goes back yeah. centuries yeah. because it's such a, so I think um, with all that going, this there is a company that I think has started to branch into the US. Mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting. I just like to watch these trends because, yeah. So. yeah And then when you see people respond to it and, you know, you're right, there is already articles coming out that these postnatal retreats are pretty much targeted to mostly the wealthy or those who Mm want to save up and spend on it. Mm -hmm. The, you know, general population, I would count myself in it because I didn't work ever since I moved to the States from Mm -hmm. Australia. Um, And because of my husband's work, you know, it's easier for me to just stay home and do all the things. Uh, we can't afford to go to these postnatal retreats, even to hire a doula, an overnight nanny, like we would have to think twice. So it was more right. cost effective for us to even pay for my mom to fly over. Oh, sure. 
yeah rather than do that so yeah, yeah it's just interesting with it everything is. happening around this it is I mean it sounds like uh, it people wouldn't be drawn to it if there weren't some benefit um if, yeah if and even if it is like slightly different in different countries or you know what whatever there the the um the thread through all of it is that it's there and has been there for centuries as a practice because it is helpful. Yes. Right. right yep. Which I, I, I absolutely, yes. I mean, for myself, what was really wonderful was being able to not worry about my food. The nutrition part was huge for me mm. because the practice insists, uh, especially in the Chinese side, you've got hot foods and cold foods. And the idea during this time through the Chinese medicine principles is you are so depleted in your blood, in your chi, in mm. everything that mm. when you nourish, you know, this new mom, you have to give her food that warms, that brings the blood. So high protein, when you think about it, it actually correlates with our Western, you know, nutrient approach because high protein, iron, hydration, you want to really boost, mm -hmm. you know, the, the body so that the building blocks are there when you're recovering from childbirth because yeah. it's so tedious. It's so, yeah. you know, um, so I felt great, honestly, eating the food because the way it's also they believe it has to be prepared as warm, mm -hmm. <laughs> cooked fresh, which I know a lot of families in the US, you can't afford that both time, energy and money. Mm -hmm. But you know, and this is something I've checked with some Chinese medicine doctors, it's okay to microwave your food, if you want to follow this practice, mm -hmm. it's okay to prep stock up, which I did the same and then microwave it because, you know, the nutrients are still there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a lot of misconception in nutrient that microwave, you're just going to nuke your food and all the nutrients are gone or frozen food has no value. Mm -hmm. um, but it's just, you know, the, the Chinese side, and this is even coming from my mom who brought up, she's like, you must cook your food fresh. I'm like, I don't have the time and energy to do that. <laughs> but it felt great the second time around when uh, we had our second child in Germany, uh, COVID and things. So my mom came later, but my husband was the one who did... Uh, we, I call him the confinement Manny. <laughs> Manny. Uh, but he enjoyed it a lot because he felt, you know, how with most men, they cannot participate, obviously, in the pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So the postpartum is when they can really engage. And those who want to find that a really valuable time. So my husband wanted to do that with our first, but with my mom there, we were, mm -hmm. you know, figuring things out. He yeah. didn't really have a space. Um, but the second time we made sure that if anything we get this 30 days first to ourselves, mm -hmm. and he could be there he cooked all my food he did he made sure my herbs that I, I drank my herbs every day and everything that I needed and you know it, I think it was good for him the second time around mm -hmm. um and yeah I think with the second time around we did it better it felt better and although we had microwaved and frozen food prepped I still felt the same in terms of when I eat the food, it still felt warm mm -hmm. and healthy and nourished mm -hmm. because we prepared it in that way that is supposed to nourish a recovering body. Right. So I think that if anything, the nutrition part is very important um, in this practice. And then of course, the rest part is the one where yeah. in the olden days, they say bed rest all the time, but we know now prolonged bed rest is no good for the body. Mm -hmm. So a lot of Chinese medicine practitioners also say you got to do some light activity, which basically just means walking mm -hmm. with your baby and that's it. <laughs> yeah. Until you actually recover, then, you know, you can do more after that. Oh, well that, I mean, there's, uh, there's right. Uh, obviously so much benefit to that. And I, as you were talking about like the importance of rest, um, I had like a little flash in my mind of, um, you know, how quickly, um, I've heard of some people being like pushed back into work or they, they can't mm -hmm. even, um, take, you know, more than two weeks off, um, mm. or four weeks or six weeks, whatever, um, you know, and, and a lot of laws can shape that. Um, so yeah, I mean, for, uh, for some people would really benefit from ha being able to have this time. Um, but, but can't, um, I, I assume some bit of it would help even if they can't do the whole 30. Yes, this is actually something that I do address in my book. I call it the bare necessities, <laughs> not after Jungle Book, but, <laughs> oh, right, right. but yeah, but it literally is if you really cannot rest or anything, 
if there's one thing you can at least do is the nutrition because then you you get the building blocks that you need right. and the other part is if you can at times get some help get some sleep because sleep and nutrition pretty much are the things we need to recover without sleep. I mean, your brain literally is just not going to function. You, right. It's just a spiral downhill. Our right. body recovers when we sleep. And, right. you know, when you don't sleep enough, your whole body is pretty much in a fight and flight stage because the only times our body doesn't sleep is when there's danger, right? So your brain is already mm-hmm. like, oh my gosh, what's happening? And plus, you know, as a new mom, that first few months especially the first time mom oh my gosh I remember that time very clearly for me so paranoid all the time at the Mm -hmm. little sound at the Mm -hmm. the phantom cries the like oh my gosh I was like what is going on to me that that you know massive overnight change was so jarring yeah um and I think this type of practice and if parents have the ability to rest is definitely beneficial because the adjustment time it you know, we say six weeks postpartum, but to be honest, we actually don't really have a proper definition, which is something I'm working on right now to redefine what postpartum actually means and mm-hmm. who are, who is involved. Because we know like dads are not even invited in any part of the journey, right? which I think is completely wrong. Um, is. And dads are already asking to be part of it. And I'm glad there are those who just make themselves part of it, regardless of whether <laughs> they're invited or not. That's amazing. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, the recovery part, better definitions need to be in place, not just to guide clinicians, but us so that right. we know what to expect. And not only that, it informs policy, it guides employers right. to have better things in place for their, you know, employees who want to build a family. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're so right. And there's different um, definitions just uh, for, for lots of things. Like if, you know, talking to a medical, or let's say an OB, um, postpartum could mean, you know, anywhere from a, a month to six weeks or something like that, where if mm-hmm. we're talking about um, <clears throat> uh, mental health, postpartum, yes. mood and anxiety disorders, we're talking about a year or more, mm-hmm. um, a, a span of time. Um, yeah. So it, just having some understanding of this idea that we have adapted our thinking to um, policy, meaning like, okay, you have six weeks uh, that you have until you have to go back to work. And now we've decided that that means postpartum. Mm -hmm. Um, Like we, that it has to be the other way around. Like you're not done. You're not like all better just because you can like technically medical disabilities up and you can go back to work. Yeah, I think that that's why I love how at least the past year, a lot of scientific, um, the academic journals are putting out more things related to maternal health, not just pregnancy, because even for me, I remember med school, when we think maternal health, we think pregnancy time. And that's it. We don't really talk about postpartum. Mm -hmm. And when I was doing stuff, even after my book was published, I thought, okay, now I want to do more. I want to, you know, not just my work, but maybe the second edition, I want to expand on some concepts. I started asking my friends who are training to be OBs and GPs I know in Australia, because that's more where my medical connections are, who are doing women and perinatal health and family mm-hmm. medicine. I'm like, is there a postpartum physiology textbook somewhere? So I can go and like educate myself as well. Because, you know, I've been away from medicine for a while. And they're like, eh, no, not really. You know, maybe some journal articles. And I'm kind of like, Okay, we <laughs> have pregnancy wrong, yeah. physiology, but yeah, what about postpartum? Like, what about the variations in those of us, you know, the hormone levels and then the breastfeeding versus none? Like, there's a lot to it. Um, but there really isn't. There is no textbook to guide even clinicians on like what is postpartum physiology. And to think even our health providers and our scientists don't know enough. How can we advocate for our health? How can our policymakers and employers make good environments for us if we just don't know much about this time, which pretty much speaks for women's health in general? Well, Um, that's true and very depressing. It is. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, that's why I'm, I'm so glad where I am right now is like talking to you 
me going to conferences and um, I'm, you know, involved with the European Lifestyle Medicine Organization here. Um, I took the course to just give myself, um, because when I transitioned out from medicine, I was like, oh, you know, how to find my place. Like not many medical doctors try to pivot into, I don't know, uh, usually you you try to do something more like I'll do consulting or go into mm-hmm. insurance. Mm-hmm. I had no interest in those things. Um, I, I was trying to find a career path for myself. And so being in Europe, I thought, oh, let me check out lifestyle medicine because it might be missing some things I felt would have helped me when I was practicing medicine. And mm. I found out if I did that, I could do some health coaching and Great. say, you know, I'm a lifestyle you know, a medicine advisor. So, but through that, I realized that, you know what? postpartum and then being a parent that's a lifestyle by itself right and you think about it right you, yeah. your finances your social habits your everything changes and your expect to function in six weeks after that is ridiculous that is rid- um it is ridiculous so for me I started to shift my view of postpartum and everything and then when I thought about the confinement practice in that sense I'm like that kind of, it's a great fit in when we think about postnatal in lifestyle because it engages community. And then we're talking about nutrition pillars, social connection pillars, environment, physical health, sleep. I was like, wow, okay, this is, it's a great you know, way to approach. So right now, when I talk about all of these things, I try to tie in the lifestyle aspect also so that we understand that it's not just a physical health thing. It's not just a mental health thing. Right. It really takes a team of, you know, to surround ourselves with a team of health professionals and non-clinical providers and businesses, you know, different industries who could help us. That's why apps are great. Mm-hmm. You know, um, look, you know, it's definitely seeing a pelvic health specialist, a physical therapist, just yeah. to even check, do I need some pelvic health therapy? What's my pelvic health like? Mm-hmm. That's worth it. Because childbirth is so, it's so much to it's it so with your much. pelvic floor. Yeah. Um. So it helps that you know we understand then, like you know, for your listeners, where there's like, there's so many people you can make part of your team. It really yeah. is a teamwork. Yeah. And I think it's important even for clinicians to understand that rather than have someone try to own it mm-hmm. or say mm-hmm. that oh the businesses are going to do it because you know postpartum wellness is a business thing, but it's not, it's really, everyone's got to work together so that we and, you know, our fellow moms can benefit better. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, what, how did you come to want to write um, postpartum 30 and and what what is in there? (laughs) I love telling the story because it started off as just a scrapbook idea. I was just going to be like, oh, I'll just start a scrapbook, pass it down to my kids. Because uh, especially once I found out I was having a girl, I was like, oh, so many things <laughs> come crashing realization on you. Uh-huh. Um, and then I wanted to do the practice 100%. And I realized there was no actual book to describe the practice. There are a lot of good recipe books, a lot of mm-hmm. blogs as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, my mom actually passed down a recipe book that she used to me. I love that. I was like, I love this whole passing down thing. I love um, and in that book, there were a lot of little nuggets on, oh, why you eat this food or, uh, and the author is from Singapore. So pretty much the cousin of Malaysia. Mm-hmm. And she described within Chinese families, we have different dialects and even the dialects have different um, approaches to how they think which food is best for the you know recovering mother. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, but nothing to actually talk about. What's this practice? Where did it come from? You know, how do we adapt it to the modern life? And mm. even going online, I uh, when I did like a audience research for my book, some of the uh, responses were I even tried going to YouTube or TikTok or social media, and it was mostly people talking about their confinement, you know, retreat experience rather mm. than what is this practice and yeah. things. So I thought, oh, maybe I'll just document my experience and put my reasonings into a scrapbook for my daughter um, and now two daughters Mm -hmm. in case they want to practice this you know they can have a reference in English because (laughs) I'm not fluent in Mandarin Um, and then from there the more my friends I talked to even my mom because I actually worked with this with her a few things I was like is this okay you know because you're an elder 
what do you right. think if someone younger tweaked this practice, you know, a little bit, what do you think? Um, so right. she gave me that insight and I asked my aunts as well. Nice. Um, and then from the feedback I got, I thought, you know what, this needs to be an actual book rather than just a scrapbook project for my kids. Mm. And then it's the ball started to roll. And as soon as I did that audience research, like within a few days, I had a hundred responses. Like you got to write this. And people mm. were asking, like, this is what I struggled with. You know, could you write about this, especially with um, how do I tell my mother or mother-in-law I want to do this my way, that relationship part, because yes. there's so many levels to when you're talking about intergenerational things. Yep. And that's why I get so passionate about this topic, because it's not just like a postnatal practice, you know, and different cultures have a very similar thing. It's such a generational thing as well there's legacy behind yeah. it there is roots there's heritage it's yeah that's why I love it because it's Definitely. so so rich and so deep yeah so that's what started it started as a scrapbook and now <laughs> it's an actual book book yeah uh, but that's uh, that is so great right I mean it, it it carries deeper meaning when you know this in history and you know the why and it's not just like okay I'll s- string these recipes together and I'll make sure that whatever, you know, that people are having to, to pull together themselves, uh, like being connected to the deeper meaning and deeper understanding. And the um, like you were saying, the reasons why certain um, herbs are used, like that kind of stuff. It just it I think m- makes it more impactful, too, on the, mm-hmm. on the individual. Yes, definitely. I actually found out that um even obviously Africa all the different tribes different ethnicities within Africa everyone has their own postnatal practice Mm -hmm. which is very similar Eastern Europe as well I think some of the women I know um I made a friend when I was in Germany she's from Croatia she's like oh we do 40 days I was like oh that's cool (laughs) some Chinese some Chinese do 40 days I know a lot of the Malay uh, women they do 40 days in Malaysia as well so there is a variation and I did Mm -hmm. find out at least from the Chinese side that back all the way, because there was this um, publication called Childbirth in Imperial China. It's one of those nerdy academic articles that I love. I'm sure you <laughs> love it too. <laughs> um, they describe that the childbirth period or postpartum period essentially uh, varied between three days to one year. So there's mm-hmm. three days, you know, five, seven days, 30 days, 100 days, and then one year. And it was all pretty much dependent on which uh, dynasty was in power and what the imperial doctor decreed pretty much wow. which is no different from today we think about it we have no our kidding. associations organizations who thankfully through you know research and evidence base now we come up with updated guidelines and durations it's the same thing to be mm-hmm. honest so mm-hmm. I think end of the day 30 days and off for me I picked 30 because that's what my family followed that's what a lot of us more I guess the modern you know, Malaysians follow. And plus, it just makes sense with our modern family lifestyle now, Mm -hmm. our calendars, our work life, 30 days, one month just makes sense. (laughs) So, you know, and also the, um, the Chinese medicine physicians that I'm now partnered with in the work that I do, and she specializes in Singapore, um, a Chinese medicine maternity clinic. Mm. Um, And even within the Chinese medicine text, she does 28 days. And then up to a hundred days, depending on, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that, that goes into deep that even I'm like, okay, that's too much information <laughs> for me. Um, so it, that there, there is some, I guess that there is the correlation and backing from Chinese medicine as well for this period of time of rest and recovery. Yeah. And what are people, what's your feedback, um, on, on the book and how are you, how are people finding it helpful? Like, what are they telling you? Um, they what they found helpful I think one of the best things I heard was um, it made them feel heard and seen that oh I'm not the only one struggling with these issues or these wonders Um, or even one of um, my beta readers was like uh, I was actually really curious like why are we doing these things because a lot of these traditions are passed down and you get the elders telling you well, I did it, so you got to do it. <laughs> and then, you know, we're raised to challenge, right? I guess the modern female generation modern, is like, you yeah. can do anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we asked, you know, why? Why? And like a three year old, why? And they can't really give us an answer because then they themselves didn't ask why or wasn't told 
um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, my mom's mm-hmm. generation. So it helped for them to understand like, oh, this is why. And I had um, someone read this. She married uh, an Asian, into an Asian family. She's white and Caucasian. And she married into this Asian culture. And then she was told by her mother-in-law, you got to do this. Mm-hmm. And she's like, oh, if I had this resource, I would have understood more why she wanted me to do this and maybe not fight so much. Right. Like, it's just like not, I'm just being like trying forced. to be controlling. Yes, mm-hmm. there is a reason why we do this. So I thought to me that was a lovely, uh, I didn't expect some of these feedback, mm-hmm. which was really nice for me. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, I mean, I imagine mm-hmm. if, you know, done with family members in, in a certain way, it's um, uh, like if you, let's say, I'm just going to take like one example that's in my brain. Let's say you don't have like a very like, um, touchy feely sort of like um, emotional mother or um, mother-in-law or even grandmother let's say but they provide you care in this way like it seems mm-hmm. like a very loving practice um, or there, there's potential for it to be um, to provide this kind of care in just such a unique period of time um, uh, to to give that to somebody that you care about. I can personally attest to that because my mom and I, we don't do hugs. Uh-huh. Never oh. have. I, yeah. I feel awkward if uh-huh. I were to, but she hugs my grandkids. I mean, <laughs> sorry, she ha- she hugs her grandkids, not my grandkids, <laughs> but pardon me. Um, but, and I just can't, that's not something we do. Right, right. But during this time, it was like, do you need anything? Do you need any food? Tell me what you like. I'll cook for you. Mm-hmm. And she'll stand there and grate the ginger and mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. boil the soup and mm-hmm. do all of that, which is so labor intensive. Right you know, um, and making sure like, is your hair dry? You come out the shower, mm-hmm. you know, it might sound naggy to some and controlling, but you're right. It's a different type of love language, if you would. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I do notice that in a lot of, I, maybe the generational thing. And mm-hmm. I guess in your work, you find out a lot of generational trauma, I guess is one Loves. thing. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that communication, like nobody knows how to emote because emotion is weak to a lot of cultures right. as well. Right. And this is truly one way where for a moment, things get broken down a little bit. Mm-hmm. But though we still get told, don't cry during this time, don't get mm-hmm. too emotional because it's not good for your health, mm-hmm. which ties in, d- does tie in with some Chinese medicine principles that too much emotion can upset your internal balances, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean you can't express them. So I think this is where the taboo side doesn't really align with the Chinese medicine. Um, And that's one, a couple of things in my book, I do challenge outright, like don't tell a mom to suppress. Like if you're reading this, you know, it's okay to be emotional in your 30 days because you are in this havoc and roller coaster of hormones you really can't do much about it and to be told don't emote is just not great for your mental health at all Um, the other thing I challenge is um, the exclusion of dads and men Mm -hmm. from this time Mm -hmm. and because way back when and it's still a belief now that's prevalent in many um, societies and cultures is like it's bad luck to come in contact with the products of childbirth like how Mm -hmm. menstruation is bad luck in Mm -hmm. plenty of cultures um, so back in the days, the men weren't allowed. And that's why you also do the confinement, because mm. after this time, uh, the mom and the baby like do this wash and then you wash away the pollution. Mm. I hate these words. I'm rolling my eyes now because <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's so ah, it's yeah. so degrading. But that was the belief back then. And so after they do the confinement, then they're presented to the family, to the husband, to the father. And you are now lucky because you've washed the pollution off of you. Mm. Um, so a lot of men have been excluded. And that's one thing I actually recommend in my book is I do believe that the spouse and the partner should actually be the main confinement support person, mm. whether or not you have the community, because this is such a tender time, especially again, for the first time parents. Right. Overnight, you just suddenly have to care for this baby. Right. And everything you've known is literally upside down, you know, within this few hours that it takes so much time to adjust to these dynamic. And I think to have like, it's great again to have the support, but to have so much in your face in that first month, even mm-hmm. it, I don't know, to me, it just that the dynamics, it, at least if you do it 
mostly by yourself and then you know with external supporting you maybe to bring food for you to help you clean the house and all those things but as the main confinement support person if that remains the spouse or the partner you can really find your ground at your own pace at this time right and then you know you support back and forth in that way so and especially you know with dads um, I think 2019 if I'm not wrong uh, so only in the past what five six years they've actually started studying the effect of pregnancy and childbirth on dads Mm -hmm. because it's a myth right that men have no part to play in this um, thing and they found that Again, it's a European study, of course. I feel like Europe kind of leads most of the way in a lot of these Mm. family things Mm -hmm. um, and research. Um, They found that men do have changes in testosterone during pregnancy um, and how much they interact with the baby and the infant, even at the early stage, can affect their hormones, which then goes to regulate the behavior, which we know physiologically that's how we work, right? The more you interact with the behavior, things get regulated. So it's fascinating, um, you know, for me that I found this paper only after I published my book and I thought, hey, that matches what I (laughs) recommend. Yay. (laughs) Good for me. Good for me. Um, But yeah, that's that's really what I the two main things I challenge in my book are those things, which I think even for this practice to survive Mm -hmm. in modern times, you have to adapt it and you you have to start inviting other people to be involved. Otherwise, it's really just going to be forgotten. And that's it. Man, that right. (laughs) That is that is true. That that just has to be. um, Yeah, I'm just putting an exclamation point on that um, because it uh, you're right. It does have to be. I mean, not necessarily modernized, but I guess that's, mm. yeah, modernized. Um, yeah. <laughs> because, right. Because society is changing. Things are changing and shifting um, in, in certain areas in, you know, different ways than others. But mm-hmm. um, especially if there's kind of like a, a boon in this, co- this practice coming back, um, it makes sense for it to be a thought of in a, in a, modern or more modern user-friendly kind of a way absolutely yeah it's um I would say that uh I I I do feel glad to be honest that this is catching in the west and even in Europe um (laughs) I've managed to step my foot in the Chinese medicine scene here it's surprising though Kat uh (laughs) Chinese medicine is huge here it's been in Germany for 70 years, seven zero. Um, it's big there. It's big in Switzerland. They're pretty much the leading places in Europe for Chinese medicine. Oh, yeah. And in Europe, because they're more strict with, you know, Europe is strict with pretty much a lot of regulations. Um, you Most of the Chinese medicine practitioners, at least I know in Germany, they have to also be physicians. So they are, you know, allopathic Western trained physicians who went to medical school. And they do extra two, three years of Chinese medicine training. And they apply both um, allopathic and Chinese medicine in their assessment. So it was fascinating when I went to a conference and you have um, OBGYNs who are doing fertility work. Uh, oncologists, anesthetists, and even um, clinical pharmacy or pharmacists uh, who are doing drug herb interactions. And wow. they're all combining their Western, you know, approaches with the Chinese medicine. That's great. I was blown away. I was like, and I'm like, this is not even happening in Malaysia. It's not in, <laughs> there's maybe a couple of hospitals where we have, like in Kuala Lumpur, there is a hospital called Tungshin Hospital, where it's literally the Western block and the Chinese medicine block. And I have seen like stroke patients, especially who, um, you know, they've cleared the acute stage, whatever's happening. And then they, they get brought over to the Chinese medicine site to get acupuncture to start their rehab. That's awesome. So that does happen, but not, to the extent that I see here, they have huge conferences. It's just so fascinating. Well, I hope that for me, on. yeah, for me to have to come all the way to Europe <laughs> to figure, you know, to to find out about this. When right, I mean, right. to be honest, growing up in Malaysia and even med school, I was told, you know, uh, Chinese medicine is poo poo, it's woo woo. You know, Western allopathic medicine is the way, and you can't do both. You got to choose one part and. When I grew up kind of with both, because my mom and my aunts follow it, mm-hmm. uh, we, of course, we have a family doctor. We kind of use both, have mm-hmm. always done that. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of an odd place for me to be until I, I'm here and I found this. And I do feel 
honestly, personally, a lot better being able to merge both sides. Like, I feel like I'm in the place I'm meant to be now. (laughs) That's so great. Yeah. That's so great. I mean, I, it makes so much sense to, it shouldn't be siloed. There are things to, that are useful, um, on all, all facets of, uh, healthcare and tradition and conventional and like, why is it all so separate? Um, but (laughs) I guess because we have to categorize things. Right. You know, I, I do tell my husband, I said, you know, in the next few years of my work, I really hope because, you've, you know, we notice right now um, our Western medicine, we don't really have a actual like, childbirth recovery program, so to speak. You know, right. like once you're out of hospital, I mean, the best way for me to put the analogies this. So I used to practice geriatric medicine, elderly health in Australia before I left and did all of this stuff. And what I found that is missing in postpartum is uh, there is, at least in the US, there's a huge emphasis on birth plans. That's mm-hmm. I felt when I was having my baby in Alabama, I was like, birth yeah. plan, birth plan, birth plan. Nobody yeah. talks about the postpartum plan unless you've hired a doula right. or somebody who talks about that to you. But right. if you don't, it's not in the clinical side. Right. Um, I think that's a big glaring gap that really needs like the postpartum plan needs to start while you're pregnant so you can plan for it and not do it overnight of course um and I I'm really hoping that you know with the confinement practice because it's been done not just in Asian culture but all cultures around the world this concept of rest you know if one day I hey maybe with you together who knows if you know all of us could work together to translate this into a kind of modern I don't know childbirth recovery program that clinicians can at least adopt I think that could be a good start towards better maternal health outcomes because when the elderly patient hits you know the emergency ward to get admission just like how a mom says hey I'm here to deliver a baby at least in Australia, we have a discharge plan right from the get-go. Even the attending mm-hmm. physician, or at least that's the training we got, is when I go see my patient, I'm assessing, you know, what are the medical problems, da da da. But at the same time, I'm thinking at the same time, we gotta start discharge planning for this patient. Means I engage the team, we talk mm-hmm. to their family members, we find out the home situation, we engage social work, the whole list of team yep. that then, you know, we get them through whatever acute illness they have. But everyone's in place to know, okay, as soon as this is done, click, 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 click. And then they transition home. We don't have that for moms and dads no. at all. No. And I found that baffling. I was like, man, I mean, we talk point. about we talk about discharge planning in all sorts. Orthopedics, going for a surgery, like this mm-hmm. is what, I mean, leaving postpartum with a sheet is not enough because it's <laughs> no. such a life-changing event. It so is, I really yeah. hope one day, you know, using the basis of you know the confinement mm-hmm. practice hopefully we can inform something a good program or something down the road Absolutely. that at least can be a good buffer from giving birth to six weeks and then we can do more later yeah after that so yeah that'll Absolutely. be the dream for me That's, so we'll it's see a good dream I'm I'm <laughs> on board with your dream <laughs> uh, one thing that struck me you know so I mean Thinking back now, uh, my eldest is four. So I've done basically two confinement practices. And um, because I had such bad postpartum depression after my first, and I was actually on medication up until my second was about a year old before I felt I was in a good enough place to wean myself off. Um, So I basically did my confinement with on uh, the antidepressant at the second time. Mm -hmm. And, you know, looking back, I think there were two things I hope going forward. Uh, That's why in my book, I like to mention, please always uh, engage your Chinese, a Chinese medicine practitioner who can prescribe you herbs and also engage your, um, you know, Western or allopathic physician because drug herb interactions do exist. Mm. Um, I learned in the conference that, um, uh, and I can't remember the actual species of ginseng, but there is a type of ginseng that has serotogenic effects, which means if you have the ginseng and you take an SSRI, yeah. Yeah. the antidepressant, the effects, yeah. you know, and I was doing that because I didn't know. Right. Uh, second time around, I was on my antidepressant, which was sertraline. Um, mm-hmm. 
And then I did my confinement. My mom had the ginseng. I was like, sure, it's boosting. I'll just put it in my food. And then when I learned at this conference, I was like, oh, I mean, I'm glad nothing happened to me. Yeah, and sure. that I didn't I didn't take the ginseng at such a medicinal dosage as well, because mm-hmm. dosage usually, yeah, it's the one that makes the poison, so to speak. Um, so I thought, oh my goodness, like we need to know more about these things and have both clinicians on both sides to yeah. come together so that those of us who do practice this and follow and want to take the herbs, we got to make sure whatever other health issues we may have from pregnancy or not, and any medications we're taking don't cross interact and cause us more grief. So mm-hmm. I think that's important. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other thing, you know, thinking back, um, I always wondered, at least after my second confinement, I still felt really tired all the time to a point I did ask my Chinese medicine pharmacist friend. Um, I'm like, is there something I could take for energy? Because I'm like, this is odd. I felt mm-hmm. I was getting enough sleep, or at least I had no problems falling asleep. Mm-hmm. Um, I was eating all right because my depression is, you know, managed and right. all of that. Uh, and I was taking a lot of naps in the afternoon, uh-huh. like to a point where I had to nap. So I guess in clinical terms, you call this daytime sleepiness because mm-hmm. you literally cannot stay awake. Uh-huh. And this was in Germany, uh, two dogs, two young kids <laughs> um, with my husband having to, you know, leave for missions often. And at one point, they had to deploy and here I was in the afternoon falling asleep in a third floor apartment alone mm. where I couldn't wake up from that nap. Yeah, I was like, no, this is getting dangerous. So I got myself checked out. Mm. And of course, the whole time my husband was like, your snoring is bad, like bad. <clears throat> I would wake oh. him up oh. and um, <clears throat> excuse me. And there were times where I would be sleeping in the living room and he could still hear me. Mm. and our apartment in Germany was very long so living room like right at the end and master and he was like I can hear you I was like okay Crystal you got to stop being stubborn (laughs) it sounds like sleep apnea because it's classical snoring daytime sleepiness just tired all the time although I feel like I'm sleeping and there were I didn't have any other health issues like I didn't have low iron like no low vitamin d like nothing else that could you know, so finally went to get my sleep study done. I clocked in at 20, almost 28, 29 apnea episodes per hour. So what? Yeah. So basically every time I slept at night, there were 29 times that I had a moment of when I stopped breathing in one hour (laughs) with enough drops of oxygen that my body would, you know, like wake up, something's going wrong. Uh, yeah. And I was like, oh, well, crap. Yeah. Uh, so ever since then, and I actually only got diagnosed uh, last September because mm-hmm. I finally didn't want to be stubborn anymore. Mm-hmm. And after that <laughs> feeling of, you know, this is too dangerous for my kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'm on the CPAP machine uh, mm-hmm. and I'm finally not, you know, feeling tired all the time. And, oh. you know, uh, and the thing is with the machine, like, so I did do a respiratory term in Australia. We had to do different rotations, um, you know, until you finish and do your training. Mm-hmm. Um, I did do a term, so three months in respiratory. And so I'm familiar with the CPAP, what it does, and the type, the, the usual image of people who have sleep apnea, obstructive mm-hmm. sleep apnea. I don't fit the bill because I'm not super obese. I'm not male. I'm not old, <laughs> you know, I don't have any other chronic problems. So when I tell people I have sleep apnea, they go like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. you don't fit. And I say it's from pregnancy and I go, huh? <laughs> yeah. And so my, what my sleep doctor explained to me was when you're pregnant, your entire anatomy shift because our trachea, our windpipe, everything's held taut when you're not pregnant because right you know, the diaphragm is pulled straight. But as soon as your pregnant baby's growing, you can imagine everything gets pushed upwards. So everything you have here is kind of like floppy. It's all over the place. (laughs) So technically, technically any, you know, female who gets pregnant, you are at risk of developing, developing snoring purely by anatomical changes alone. Wow. If you think about that, you know, it's a a no brainer. I never thought about this. Yeah. When when I saw that you were going to talk with us about this, I was so (laughs) excited. Yeah. But he told me, I was like, duh. And I felt pretty dumb because I'm like, 
shit, I went to med school. Pardon, <laughs> pardon my language. It's fine. It's fine. Went to med school and like did a term and like, why did it click for me? Mm-hmm. Like it was so mm-hmm. obvious. Um, and not only that, when you're pregnant, like for me, I got really swollen um, mucous membranes, right. like my, as though my allergies came up. So, yeah. and that also affects snoring because all your airways are kind of tightened up, your airflow. Yeah. So uh, we're set up to fail essentially oh, <laughs> through pregnancy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, but whether or not, you know, that snoring actually becomes obstructive, you know, some women do get there, some don't, we don't know enough. And that's mm-hmm. where, you know, the current work among all the things I'm doing, one of it is to explore this more with, you know, my sleep doctor, because he does a lot of research in this area um, is to put out more and better literature because he treats women like me and pregnant women as well both postpartum and you know pregnant women in his clinic so you know he has some data that we can talk about this more academically and also like platforms like this talking to you Kat I can talk about this so for your listeners you're pregnant especially when you start hitting your second trimester even if you're not snoring like a freight train, but you're just <laughs> feeling tired all the time, mm-hmm. being told, eh, it's just pregnancy, it's just hormones is not enough. Right. It's not enough. Definitely explore. Could this be snoring? Do I need to explore this more with a sleep study just mm-hmm. to see, even if I don't have obstruction, could the snoring be bad enough to affect some of my breathing yeah. and my oxygen at night and this is the thing though the whole body is going to protect that baby because mm-hmm. if you think about it if the body didn't do that and we're prone to snoring because of anatomy changes in pregnancy mm-hmm. then we're going to have a lot of hypoxic babies which mm-hmm. is not the case right, right so right. the body will wake you up yeah. which then means you don't get enough sleep even if you don't know you're waking up and right. then you're just tired all the time But the other thing is this, Uh, I had uh, gestational hypertension towards Mm -hmm. the end of my first pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And then even, um, and my blood pressure kind of went up uh, right after like I delivered my baby and then placenta Mm -hmm. and it didn't come down for two weeks. And my Mm -hmm. OB was kind of like, oh my God, what's going on? And I was like, please don't let this develop into like you know, postpartum eclampsia or something like, oh my gosh, please don't. That was scary for a bit um, because I had symptoms with the high blood pressure as well. Thankfully, that resolve went away. Um, And then I had gestational diabetes with my second pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, I could control with diet. But as we know, no fun poking yourself all the time and controlling your food when you're pregnant, (laughs) when you eat everything. Um, And again, my risk factors were not very high. And now I asked my sleep doctor, I was like, you know, what do you think? Could these things have been prevented if I had my snoring checked out? He said, maybe, but we, again, don't have enough data to confidently say Mm -hmm. yes or no. Right. But it's interesting to think that snoring is not a question asked in like when someone, a pregnant woman or postpartum mom says, I'm tired. We just told, ah, well, you know, you've got kids, you've got a new baby, um, we right. don't, it's not part of clinical practice to ask the screen. So, I mean, you know, I'm hoping down the road with the work we're doing, we could bring some more clinical data to this mm-hmm. area. Yes. And, you know, but at least those who are listening, and this is something I talk a lot about with uh, my military friends. And I try as much when I volunteer in the community to specifically talk about this because I can tell them, go to your OB or primary care manager, get that referral. Yeah and get checked <laughs> just yeah, absolutely. in case. I'm going to, I'm, I'm like literally going to put it on my intake <laughs> now. <laughs> I mean, I, yes. And for you is such a symptom for even mental health. Like yes. tiredness is such a, it's yes. vague, but it's, you know, right. it's, it's an important symptom. Absolutely. It absolutely is. I mean, yeah, it, it's like one of those things that it's easy enough to say like, Hmm, I wonder if this could be a part of what's going on for you go talk to your doctor about something. yeah and I did struggle with losing some weight I know I don't look it on the screen now uh, I'm kind of short like five two and um, my doctor did say he's like you know for and because of my southeast Asian ethnicity and you know other risk factors that I have he's like you know the weight gain that I got in pregnancy uh, the like the effects is 
double or more compared to someone else who might gain the same weight just because of other, you know, um, I guess, I can't, I can't find the word right now, but yes. So for me, he said that with the snoring, it would definitely be difficult for me to lose the weight, no matter how much I would have tried, because just like what we know about sleep apnea is when your body gets into that, you know, vicious cycle of not enough sleep, not enough mm-hmm. oxygen, it prepares itself for fight or flight. It's going to hoard all the resources. Mm-hmm. So it's not going to let you lose weight. And then you can't exercise because you're tired mm-hmm. and the, the cycle just goes on and on. So right. he told and me- Like if you're, mm-hmm. t- if you're tired and you're not getting a uh, restoration from, from sleep, sometimes people eat more too. Oh, Because yes, you need 100%. fuel somewhere. 100%. <laughs> oh, man. It's vicious. It's so yeah. vicious. Yeah. And so for me right now, like he's like, okay, Crystal, your treatment plan is, you know, get your sleep back, get the energy back, and then you start working on your lifestyle. So this mm-hmm. is where, you know, I think all of the professional development things I'm trying to do for my career is mm-hmm. so applicable to me personally. And that's right. why yeah. not just confinement, but postpartum, everything is so close to because I'm still going through some things and I'm sure. still learning some things right. um, that, yeah. So with the snoring, with the sleep apnea, my next step mm-hmm. is to like, okay, get on the exercise. And, you know, in the, a lot of times, at least in med school, we're taught, I went to med school in like 2008. So it's a while back. Um, I hope things have changed now. I don't know <laughs> what, the, what they're teaching now. Uh, but when we thought about the CPAP machine, I was like, ah, crap, if you're diagnosed with it, you're going to have the machine for life. But thankfully, my sleep doctor, he said, uh, nope, that's not the case. He's like, think of this as like glasses or something like it's an aid for you to get your sleep back, get your energy back so you can work on the other things. And once everything starts to roll like it mm-hmm. should, mm-hmm. then the machine can slowly come off. But that takes discipline, right? Mm -hmm. That's habit changing. It's a Mm -hmm. whole, you know, other thing. You need energy and bandwidth to be able to do any of it. Any of it. Actually, I will drop you some links from him as well. Because he also applies a lot of this to menopause, perimenopause, which we know is a huge other area that's... okay. You're Not coming back enough. <laughs> You're coming back. I and would we're love talk to talk about this. I'll, uh, I'll bring, I'll bring a lot more resources back. Cause um, it's just fascinating. The things I'm learning with him and through him, it's, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there. And yeah. I think with mental health is such a huge link there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Ab- absolutely. There is. Yeah. I mean, it's so just, of course. Yeah. Why aren't we talking about s- snoring and I like just you talking about being congested like during pregnancy. Yeah. It like brought me back. Like, oh yeah, I was super just like it felt like swollen in my face. Um, from I know uh, from just that. Oh, so I'm yeah. sure I looked it too. I'm sure I looked it because I look yeah. at myself pictures. Yeah. Then I'm like, yeah, that face was definitely swollen. <laughs> right. And then I actually asked, you know, my sleep doctor. I said, you know, the beneficial effects of this confinement practice right the resting the the food the everything I'm like you know what are the chances I would have felt even better if I had my sleep apnea actually managed he's like you probably would have felt better because you were doing all the right things you should be doing with your resting but he's like but you weren't getting enough sleep so whatever positive effects Mm -hmm. you were trying to gain from the confinement month probably didn't really help because your body wasn't sleeping you know, and I was like, sleep about everything. (laughs) Yeah. I was like, gosh, okay. You know, not that I'm going to try give another go a third time. I I think I'm done, (laughs) (laughs) but it was just fascinating to, I guess, see it from this perspective where this is where, you know, my, my vision of bridging the West and the East Mm -hmm. side Mm -hmm. culture and modern, you know, that then you, you kind of try to compound all the beneficial effects of all these management and treatment plans. Then you, you know, get the best outcome. So Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I thank you so much for coming on and sharing all of this. I know so many people are interested in learning more about this. Um, and through your book, it sounds like even more than what we talked about today. Uh, and then that, the snoring part, we're definitely going to talk about that again, because (laughs) my pleasure fascinating. And so like 
duh, like simple. Like, why aren't we, why aren't we talking about this? Um, I did not even think of it. So anyways, um, all of this is, is incredibly interesting and enlightening. And I thank you for your time. My pleasure, Kat. I, I love being here. Thank you. Please get connected with Dr. Crystal Lau at bridgesinhealth.com. You can find her on YouTube and TikTok at Dr. Crystal Lau. She's also on Instagram at Mama Swing Woman, as well as professionally on LinkedIn. For those of you in the California area who are looking for a therapist specialist in perinatal mental health, I've recently switched my practice around and I have some openings in my practice for private pay clients anywhere in the state of California. So if you are looking for somebody to support you, please do reach out to me. You can email me at drkat at wellmindperinatal. And if I'm not somebody who can help you, I can definitely point you in the direction of people that do. I have a vast uh, list and resource of other providers in perinatal mental health that can support you. And if you're a listener who hasn't yet rated this podcast, please right now go to wherever you're listening to this podcast and give us a a star rating and a comment if you have time so that other people who are looking for resources that can support them during this postpartum time can find this podcast. I thank you so much for listening. Until next time.